Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April LUCC. Uh, we're live and in person at ARC, um, but um, it's just me and Sam in the room right now. So, um, but hopefully next year you can uh, start seeing us um, as well, or next month, or in June um, as well. So welcome to LUCC. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April LUCC. Uh, we're live and in person at ARC, um, but um, it's just me and Sam in the room right now. So um, I hope. Um, well, we have nine people joining us virtually. Um, well, but we'll go ahead and, and get started real quick um, as well. So welcome. Uh, so we are using today using teams live events and you can ask questions to the chat um, to us um, as well and then here's today's agenda um, we're you know doing the welcome and announcement uh, we're going to kick off what we call um, our peer review um, discussion at lucc uh, have a coordination about the unified growth policy map and also do um, a brief presentation on Metro Atlanta Speaks and the SEDS as well. So um, to participate, um, you can um, just ask questions in the chat today. Um, we'll also be doing some poll um, everywhere questions and you could join and we'll redo these instructions once we get to that point as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Sam real quick. Yeah, I just wanted to say a few things about the agenda to give you folks a little bit of preview if you don't mind going back yeah. and good morning everyone and hopefully you're you're joining us from the comfort of your office or not having to um, navigate traffic downtown which but we appreciate you being here. Uh, Couple of things on the peer review, and this is something which is the original concept. I think when we created the land use coordinating committee, we did want to provide this as a venue for folks to be able to speak with one another about plans, policies, and uh, projects that they're working on and get some feedback mechanism through your peers. And so we are we're reintroducing that concept and wanted to also have you all start to think about this? We'll come back to you from time to time and say, hey, are there things that you are working on? Are there documents that we'd like you to come and share with the group and then have some sort of like discussion and fee feedback from your peers on on an ongoing uh, document or something that was recently completed and is looking to do some implementation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but one of the things we wanted to also talk to you about was the unified growth policy map and folks who are familiar with it. You know, it's been around for a long time. We do uh, want to be th thinking about uh, we will share with you today how we use it currently and how it informs the work that we do as an agency. But we also do want to be thinking about how it can be more useful for you all as you go about to your local planning initiatives. So that's that's something we'll have Jared talk a little bit about uh, and explain for folks who are new what the growth policy map does. Uh, for the local governments, but also for us as a regional planning agency. But then again, how do we make it even more impactful for the work that you do? Metro Atlanta speaks again, something that has been uh, something that has gotten a lot of attention and a lot of interest. We're going to have our own Jim Skinner uh, walk you through the the recently uh, the recent version of this survey that we completed last year. So a lot of good information in there. And then obviously for folks who have been at LUC in the past. We have been talking about the uh, comprehensive economic development strategy, the SEDS, and we're in right in the midst of updating that. We do want to be using this group as a sounding board to really hear from you. What are some of those local economic development challenges that you're facing so that can inform the plan? But we also wanted to share a little bit in terms of what has been happening and what are some of the things that we're hearing. So we'll have We'll give you a quick update on that as well. So uh, a lot packaged in here again, like Jared said, please do ask us questions and put comments in the chat as we go along. But uh, again, uh, really appreciate you making the time to being with us today. And and again, uh, you know, we when we start, this is our first hybrid meeting for LUCC and 
we, I, I would be lying if I said I did not expect more people to be online than in person because 9 a.m. navigating downtown is not ideal at times. But we do hope that we can see you, like Jared said, in future months. Um, but at the same time, we, if, if, you, if you do prefer to join us via uh, the virtual platform, we, we still want you to be as engaged in the discussion. So stay tuned and, and you'll hear from us more. All right, with that. All right, well, thank you, Sam, um, as well. And then we're going to kind of get kicked off with our first presentation about the Unified Growth Policy Map. Um, just give me a second to switch over. So oh, for those that are unfamiliar, what is the Unified Growth Policy Map? This is our regional growth vision. Um, it illustrates land use policy. It provides a spatial policy framework of different policies for different parts of the region. And it also provides recommendations for forecasting. The one, the map is our current LUCC, um, or not LUCC, UGPM map, which in the UGPM stands for Unified Growth Policy Map. Uh, originally it was called the Urban Growth Policy Map, but we now call it the Unified because we really want to make sure it's a unified plan throughout the region. We use this in a lot of different ways. Uh, one, it is that key factor in determining the DRI thresholds uh, for different projects. It also is used in the forecast um, with our research and analytics group determining where growth should occur and at, at what densities or concentrations. We also use it in roadway design recommendations um, in some of our uh, transportation policy manuals. It plays a role in transportation project selection, LCI study selection, and also the regional housing strategy. Some questions for today, and please keep um, these in mind uh, throughout the um, day or throughout my presentation is really does the UGPM reflect the planning challenges of the Atlanta region today? Um, should the UGPM be tied to stronger local plans or be more of that regional aspirations? And I'll show you where, especially in the past, where there were very different um, visions. And then how should ARC tie regional investments to the Unified Growth Policy Map as well? To kind of go back to give you some history, so this is almost close to about 20 years ago is when we first created the Unified Growth Policy Map. It first launched in about 2005, 2006. Um, to get there, I want to spend some time to talk about how we actually got to the Unified Growth Policy Map. The, we did some scenario testings through a variety of different land use visions at the time. The first one was what we call our Mobility 2030 forecast, where this was our current forecast process um, and vision for the land use planners in the room. Um, ye yellow is residential, uh, red is commercial, and so the darker the yellow, the more dense that residential is. And you can see there is not a lot of green space left or undeveloped land in the uh, 13 county Atlanta region um, at the, that we were at the time um, from this forecast. So that means we would have been sprawled throughout the whole region. And you can kind of see how what a lot of um, impacts were at the very bottom. Um, we would have low density employment evenly distributed throughout all the um, counties, um, but we would have uh, a little bit better transit ridership. This was also based on the Mobility 2030 transit forecast, uh, but you know, worse vehicles mile traveled, worse congestion, and worse impervious surface left in the region. Uh, 
these were the we compiled all the future land use plans um, between night that were done between 1998 and 2004. Um, really interesting. It had that similar population forecast as the mobility 2030 forecast, but everyone was forecasting jobs, a lot more jobs. Um, it very much did not at that time promote mixed use. You know, for example, the LCI program at this time was only about four years old. Had worse transit share and it had a lot higher uh, delay as well. And I kind of pause here because at that time there was a lot of. Interest in controlling growth in Metro Atlanta. Um, one of the interesting things was the, you know, the AJC was talking about in search of a regional cure about how to solve some of our growth and transportation challenges. And this slide I thought was very interesting about who who's it's a little blurry, but um, I cut it, cut it out, but who's in control of how influential they are in the development process at the time. Um, GDOT was actually at 65%. And then development companies are 60, county governments are at 43%. ARC is way down at 16%, but you also don't see here cities. So it was a very different time um, about 20 years ago about how we thought about growth and development. So taking all that information, we actually conducted a regional land use charrette where we developed what we call the local aspirations plan, where it's the vision of both local land use planners and elected officials. We actually showed how we could keep the same levels of growth at the county level, but just place it in different areas. And it really you know, located high density residential close to jobs along corridors and centers, very much like the LCI pro program. Um, and we also had a higher percentage accessible to transit. And all of this really led to what that first unified growth policy map. So I kind of went through that quick history just to give you an understanding of why it's kind of structured the way it was. It was really to respond to an urban growth challenge where we were, the Atlanta region was growing very quickly um, and using a lot of undeveloped land um, through the process. And this is what it is today. Um, we have what we call our regional areas um, because one of the requirements of DCA is we have to actually have a map cover the entire region of what development policies would be. So we go from rural, developing rural, developing suburbs, established suburbs, maturing neighborhoods, which a lot of people question what's the, that name is for, and that's the areas of the region that were really built between um, pre 1980s development, what we call established suburbs. So these are suburbs that are really built out that do not have much available land left. Developing suburbs, those are the more developing areas. And then also um, what we call our regional employment corridor. So these are a lot of our employment centers along um, major highways. And then <laughs> uh, we also have our regional core as well, and we have our first in-person attendee. So welcome, Margaret. Thank you for driving down from Cherokee. Well, for science, actually. Oh, for science. Oh, even boy. Uh, we appreciate it. Yes. I needed people. Yes. Oh, I'm tired of. Um, as well. And then we also have what we call our regional centers, town centers, small regional centers, regional centers, and central cities as well. Uh, how have we done over the last 20 years? Um, so this is our looking at the UGPM by area type. Um, we were now able to look back actually back to 2000 and you can see the regional core where we were expecting wanting to promote growth actually almost doubled its density um, from going about three and a half to over six, um, just under seven. Our regional employment quarters slowly crept up, maturing neighborhoods where we wanted to see some extra growth as well, increase developing our established suburbs, developing suburbs because those are the areas where we are expecting to grow, did grow. 
developing rural still had some slight growth, but what is really interesting, the rural areas is pretty flat. Um, we've you know really kind of slowed down those growth in that rural area. And Margaret's just shaking her head. <laughs> but also, this is the one that's really was really more surprising was how the density changed in our activity centers. So Midtown, you know, we think about all the growth in Midtown. Midtown had a lot of growth to begin with. But then this is you know, the 2019 numbers. Um, you know that number of housing units went from under eight uh, under 8,000 to over 18,000, about 141 percent change. Um, Buckhead still so, saw so, saw so that the West Midtown Activity Center. Um, you know the, where um, over on the you know west of Georgia Tech um, saw a 262 percent change in the number of housing units. Um, as well as even in Gwinnett or Sandy Springs and the North Point area, which went from a very small number, but still is at 162% increase. So I kind of talked about the current UGPM. One way we've kind of changed and used the UGPM is through what we call our Metro Atlanta housing strategy, where We've taken some of the UGPM character areas, but then also looked at factors looking at economics and housing real estate um, at that neighborhood level to kind of develop a new framework of regional growth and some of the regional planning challenges, especially looking at housing. And you can kind of see how this map is through the housing strategy. And different regions have also kind of identified um, it have a regional growth vision, but use it in different ways. In Minneapolis, um, they have a very strong local comprehensive planning, regional comprehensive tie rule, where each local plan must identify what community classification they are and the density standards in their plan region in their local comprehensive plan from that regional plan. San Francisco, um, they the local governments have to nominate what they call priority development areas, which identify different criteria about future growth planning and some where they get want to allocate housing. And then only those areas, those priority development areas are eligible for um, the funds from the NPO. And then Seattle. Um, they have to certify every comprehensive plan um, very similar to what we call the local implementation standards from the Atlanta Regional Plan, but they have to they update their region's plan and then every local government in Seattle then updates their comprehensive plan as a cycle. So every 10 years they update their regional vision and then every local government has to respond to that regional vision each time. Which for us with doing those local comprehensive plans would be a lot of work in like a two year period. So some of the questions for today and um, we'll kind of I'll try to see if you have put the, any responses in the chat. Um, does the UGPM reflect local the planning challenges today? Do you agree or disagree? Um, how should that UGPM be tied to local plans? And then how should uh, ARC work to tie regional investments to the UGPM? So I'm just going to pull up the chat today for the Q&A. So um, right now we don't have any open questions. Just give it a second because there's a slight delay for the live people. Or the virtual people, the in live people hear me. A couple more. Jared, who do you have in the people? How many? Who, who are the folks? Uh, we have 14 people. 
I'm just curious to hear from people like if they actually, how do they actually interact with the UGPM right now? Okay. I only look at it when it, if the RI is coming. Okay. Yeah. DRI, yes. So that is that seems to be the most commonly used, right? In terms of just seeing if it if it uh, it triggers a DRI. Oh, we did get a question. Um, Allison from Douglas County asked us, will you still be visiting each county to make updates to the UGPM and is that happening anytime soon? It's a good question, Allison, because um, we've gotten that request because uh, we did the, our last visitation around in 2019, uh, but with COVID and everything, we really kind of put a pause on it. Um, we will, it is in our work prep program, probably for next year to go out and start those discussions. We'll be also kicking off the forecasting discussions as well with the new kickoff for the RTP. So that's kind of why we're taking a step back and say, before we get into that marking up of the map, like how people use it, should we kind of do a bigger wholesale change or should we do a more, you know, limited update again? Um, yes, we will definitely be um, attending. All right, well, um, just give a couple more seconds. We're trying out a new Teams and um, live event feature, so hopefully this is how this works. Well, um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Skinner for today. Um, and Jim is going to kick us, give us a brief update on Metro Atlanta Speaks. Jim, take it away. And Jim, you're on mute. OK, can everyone see my screen? Yep. All right. Great, thanks. Appreciate the chance to be with you to talk through the results from this past year's MAS. A uh, little background on the survey to begin with. We're not going to touch on every question that we asked in 2021 today because I want to get to a point where I can give you an update on the plans, uh, evolving plans for this year and for Metro Atlanta Speaks going forward. Just a little bit on the background. As most of you uh, probably know, this came out of a leadership trip to Houston. They had a survey similar to this survey out of the Kinder Institute there, and we wanted to emulate it, bringing it back to Atlanta, wanted to gauge uh, attitudes and perceptions at the regional level. We started for the first um, eight years of this survey, seven years of this survey, with a random digit dial phone only survey. We added county level significance because that's what local jurisdictions wanted was a rich database. We expanded to cell phones. We topped out at 5,200 surveyed in 2019, but things were getting way too expensive and the phone survey response rate way too low. So we moved to mixed mode for the last two years and dropped down our level to about 4,400 last year. Still county level significance for now, our 11 county regional commission area and the city of Atlanta. The focus was really on equity this year more than ever before, along with the, you know, the trailing pandemic impacts. Uh, we got some sponsorship money from CARES because oh, of the pandemic focus, uh, as well as equity focus, as well as AARP, because as you'll see momentarily, there's a rich senior and demographic age cohort database coming out of this. What do we ask? Again, we're not gonna go with, through every one of these questions, we tried to bring as many back as possible from previous years to get that longitudinal comparison. But as I alluded to earlier, many more specific equity questions this year than previous years. You know, specific questions about discrimination against blacks. We asked specific questions about opinions on the minimum wage, opinions on how important economic equity is. 
um, as well as the pandemic workforce and labor force situation. And we asked some specific questions along the lines of vaccination status and comfort level. We'll touch briefly on the vaccination status, obviously, because August 2021, while important historically speaking, it's kind of a moving target for that. The cross tabs are where the really rich information for county level users uh, and for researchers in general comes into play. Um, and we have a, a wealth of them and they've been consistent over time. So you can track this information going back for consistent questions all the way back to the 2014 survey. Headline findings. Crime really arose to the top of our question that gets the most traction every year, which is what is the biggest problem in our region? Crime shot up to number one, uh, and we'll see just how much it shot up uh, at the expense of what, momentarily speaking. Again, economic and racial equity, we kind of got mixed messages from some of the responses that we got. Some of them were encouraging as far as people taking a broader view of the importance of those factors, uh, but some of the answers we got let us know we have a long way to go as far as embracing the need for that diversity of opinions and outlooks uh, along the lines of equity. And it was clear that even with the pandemic, even in August of 2021, this is before Omicron reared its head, it was still a very significant impact on people's day-to-day -day lives. And that translated through in terms of the way that we looked at the future. So let's look at the biggest problem. And you'll see here in the second group of bars that crime went all the way from 16% of the responses, selecting it as the biggest problem in 2020, all the way up to 32%, a doubling of share. Every other factor listed as an option dropped between 2020 and 2021, with the exception of a very small increase in human services. So the pandemic uh, had taken the first place in 2020 at 17%. Crime was all the way down at 16%. Whereas the pandemic, public health dropped off about four percentage points uh, and dropped to second uh, in the ranking for 2021, crime again doubled its percentage share. We break that down by county, and here you see uh, the sorting from top to bottom in terms of the counties that had the largest share of respondents stating that crime was the biggest problem. And you see here, if you take a quick look across all the factors, that crime is number one for each and every county in R11, uh, with the relative shares higher for suburban counties like Henry and Fayette, as well as a core county like DeKalb and Fulton, and lower uh, in the suburban counties of Cobb and Cherokee. And a big gap there you see between crime and the second place uh, biggest problem. We break this down by age and race is coming up momentarily. And you see here uh, that for every age group, crime is rated the biggest problem, but there's a dramatic increased level of assessing it as the biggest problem in the older age cohorts. You see with that purple bar there in crime that almost half of our 65 plus responses, respondents in the survey had crime as the number one problem in the region. And that drops dramatically down uh, to just over 25% for the younger cohorts in the survey. Now we'll look more closely at some of the equity questions from the economic standpoint, more so uh, first, and then the race component. We were sort of gratified. I was a little bit surprised to see two and three of our responses across the 11 counties agreed or strongly agreed that, uh, that uh, economic equity was important uh, to grow our economy in the way that it needed to be grown. Uh, what we see here is that by age, uh, we have a little bit more uh, significance placed on economic equity in the younger cohorts, you know, approaching 80 percent, actually approaching eight and 10 for the 18 through 34 cohort found it very important and essential to economic growth. That drops down, although still a significant share for the 65 plus and 50 to 64 cohorts. And we'll see this pattern. Uh, come up in, in many other questions as we assess it by age. A little bit more willingness to change to meet current economic conditions, a little more reticence in doing so for the older groups. 
looking at this by race, and it's not surprising that economic equity is a greater concern, is a greater, higher profile for those groups that have been disadvantaged historically in terms of getting the economic equity. And you see here, you were looking at about nine and 10 agreeing or strongly agreeing in, in the black uh, demographic that we surveyed, as opposed to just over two and three for the white demographic that we surveyed. So looking at here, we are looking at the, let's see if I can shrink this screen just a little bit. Jared, am I looking at minimum wage here? Uh, yes, you are. Because I cannot see the top bar of the slides, which is very interesting. Um, but what we see here is a very encouraging three and four of our respondents that were in favor of uh, exploring uh, or thinking that a minimum wage would be good for our local economy. And that ranges down only, in, in, it's over a majority in each of our counties found that that was a good idea. And this surprised us to a certain extent, over 80% for four of our jurisdictions. And so this is an even more positive response that we got here for minimum wage than we did for the more generic economic equity question. Looking at this by age, again, we see that similar pattern that I mentioned earlier. More eagerness to explore and embrace a minimum wage in the younger cohorts that are much more likely to be subject to or to get a minimum wage. The older, uh, the, the more aging that the workforce has, the less the support is for looking at a minimum wage. Uh, we'll look at this by race. And again, you see the pattern of uh, historically black and Latino populations have been more prone Tim, you broke up. Economic equity challenges we and other regions face, they're less, up, they're less eager to explore increasing the minimum wage. We have a fascinating question here on teleworking. And what we saw in 2021 compared to 2020, and again, this is a August to August comparison, is a huge increase in the share of workers responding to this survey that teleworked, at least occasionally in 2021 almost a doubling of share, almost six in 10 uh, teleworked occasionally, at least in 2021. And this speaks to economic equity. This is encouraging as far as economic <laughs> equity, because with that higher share, there's a greater outreach of potential jobs to potential labor pools, uh, as opposed to, you know, a more, uh, more designation or more restricted access to working places. We're looking now at financial stressors, and what we saw here was mixed messages. Uh, we did see maybe some positive impacts of the stimulus because we did not see an appreciable increase in the share of our respondents that really were unable to deal directly with a financial hit of $400. Uh, you see here that for uh, most of our counties, uh, in fact, there was a decrease in 2021 uh, excuse me, an increase in 2021 in the share that could deal with cash or debit um, with that uh, unexpected $400 increase. Um, this we did not necessarily expect, but we hypothesized that it's really the impact of the stimulus that was able to prop up discretionary income, even with the levels of job loss that we experienced in those periods and keep those percentages similar to what they were. Obviously, there was more stress on our non-white populations. More than half of the white population was able to pay straight out that expense with cash, check, or debit, a declining share for the Black and Latino populations. We asked specifically about housing insecurity. We were again, you know, somewhat surprised and gratified to see that overall, there wasn't a higher share in 2021 that felt less than very confident in their ability to meet their next month's housing expense. Um, the share actually declined uh, between 2020 and 2021 for areas like Clayton and the city of Atlanta that had experienced relatively more housing stress in terms of affordability and did increase actually the share 
that face that housing potential housing financial insecurity increase in Gwinnett and Cobb as you see at the lower port part of the chart. If we look at this by race again you see a similar pattern to the $400 expense larger shares uh, in the Latino and black population that were less than very confident in meeting the owner or the renter expense uh, in the coming month. And now we're going to look at uh, a question where we did get the arrow, the needles moving the wrong way, really. And there was more stress on food insecurity in 2021 compared to 2020. As you see there, almost one in four experiencing the need to go to a food bank in 2021 versus under one in five in 2020. And for almost all the jurisdictions, actually every single one, there is a tick up in that share between 2020 and 2021. Dramatic differences by race as well, um, approaching three in 10 uh, for black and Latino, down to one in five for the white population having to access food bank. And for all those racial categories, higher shares in 2021 than in 2020. This is a fascinating question. Uh, it, it comes from our uh, Center for Livable Communities director, Mike Alexander, found this in the national press. And it's really a knowledge question. How does black average wealth relate to white average wealth? This really points to the knowledge of this points to how far we think we have to go in terms of achieving economic equity. Is it a long way or is it a short way? Unfortunately, what we see here is that the actual relationship of black wealth to white wealth is one to 10. 10% 10 is the average share that a black family has compared to white family wealth. And as we see here in all of our jurisdictions, we believe that that share is actually narrower, that it's around 50% on average black wealth related to white wealth. And so there's a knowledge gap here. We don't know the extent of the economic inequity that we're facing in terms of the racial distinction. Looking at this by race, there's not a tremendous difference in the absence of knowledge. Even though our white population is most likely to think that those Wealth, wealth categories are closer. Even with the black demographic, uh, there's a 28 percentage point gap in terms of an overestimation of the relationship of black wealth to white wealth. Now let's look at equity and race. Uh, again, gratifying to see that well over two and three, almost eight and 10 agreed or strongly agreed that racial equality is important and essential to growth in our region. Looking at this by age, you see that familiar pattern of more cognition, more acceptance of the importance of racial equity for younger populations in which there is more diversity than in the older populations, which still, while they have a healthy level, almost uh, over two and three actually, that feel like racial equity is essential, much lower than the 18 through 49 components. Looking at this by race again, you are, as you would expect, you see much more uh, acceptance of the essential nature of that in the black and Latino cohorts that we surveyed as opposed to the white uh, grouping that we surveyed, but still uh, encouraging that well over two and three even in the white demographic, did find that essential to previous to uh, ongoing growth. We asked directly um, about discrimination against blacks in this survey and in last year's survey. We saw no significant decrease across the 11 counties in the share that found that a serious problem, but that share is high at over three and four and well over eight and 10 for four of our jurisdictions, the more urban jurisdictions that actually have more diversity than other areas of our region. Uh, there's a clear understanding uh, that decreases in some of our suburban areas, but it's still well over 50% that are cognizant of the fact that discrimination against black people specifically, and we were heartened we were able to ask that directly, uh, that, that the cognition is that that is a serious problem. Looking at it by age again, that similar pattern, more cognition of the serious nature of the problem in the younger cohorts 
that are more diverse themselves. And yet, still, if you add up that blue bar and the red bar there at the bottom of the chart, you see that it's over six in 10 of our seniors that realize that discrimination against black persons is a serious problem. That's that's a significant majority. However, it's much lower than nine in 10 or over nine in 10 for the 18 through 34 cohort. And now we're going to look at, um, I believe this is response to police calls. It is um, across the region. Uh, there is an increased share of our respondents in 2021 that were open to non-police entities responding to a police call when the police call was appropriate for those non-police entities to respond to. Like, is it a mental health call? Is it a social work call? More of us in 2021 were willing to accept those non-police entities responding. And across all counties, with the exception of actually DeKalb County, there was a increased share of openness to a nuanced response to police calls in 2021. Looking at this by age again, that familiar pattern, it's, it's hitting home over and over again, but we have to be cognizant of the distinction that over two in three of our senior population want the police to respond to every call. But it's just over one in three of our 18 through 34 population that think police have to respond to every call. Again, that's a significant expectation nuance that we need to be aware of. Looking at the future now, winding up with that, we're going to skip the vaccination question. It's a little bit outdated, but this from August of 2021 shows that before Omicron began to really hit home, that only about 22, well, under one in four of us felt very safe returning to our normal routines. And yet, if you add up the blue and the red bars there, you have about 80%, a, over 80% actually, that felt at least somewhat safe going back to our normal routines. We asked this question today, obviously that share would be even higher with Omicron on the wane, wane and with the BA2 variant not really taking hold to a significant extent yet. This was, uh, encouraging as far as the fact that the 65 plus and 50 to 64 cohorts here were less likely to say they felt very safe resuming their normal routine given their relative uh relative uh you know more severe illness that they're subjected to and here we're going to look at one of the questions that really pointed to the severity of the pandemic as internalized by our respondents throughout the region uh, an, a lower share uh, this year, uh, this year being 2021 compared to 2020, felt that things were going to be better in the next three to four years. So there's a decline from about one in three that felt things were going to be better in the next three to four years when we surveyed in 2020 compared to about 28% in 2021 that felt that same level of optimism. And you see in all but two counties in all but Clayton and DeKalb County, ironically, two of the counties that were hardest hit by the pandemic economically and in terms of public health. In all the other counties, there was less optimism about the next three to four years in 2021 than in 2020. And this is a pattern that we also see when we look at the results of that question by race category. And this holds true throughout all of the surveys that we've administered is that the groups, uh, the non-white groups, the groups that tend to have higher poverty, the groups that tend to have lower incomes are more optimistic about the future than groups like the white cohort here, which is relatively less optimistic for the next three to four years. And that's a fascinating pattern that has continued throughout the history of the survey. So that's a very quick run through of a ton of information we didn't deal with every question. We certainly didn't deal with every cross tab. I'm going to send out all these slides to you with the hot links embedded here. We have a special page on the AtlantaRegional.org website that arrays a lot of slide decks uh, that have many more slides than the ones you just saw. We have a dashboard that we've developed, which lets you do your own custom querying of the information. And we have a blog, 33 North, that 
we have a, a tab on that blog where we publish certain deeper dives into question areas and demographic cohorts for the survey. I'd also like to stress that, I mean, many of you on this call probably gotten an email from me at the end of last year that had county specific workbooks of Metro Atlanta Speaks results. If you're interested in that, if you missed that email, let me know and I'll send it to you. These are results that aren't, at least at the cross tab level, as significant as the results I shared with you in the presentation today, but they're still very useful for planning purposes. And we'll be glad to share them with you, even though because they're not all statistically significant, we don't share them publicly like we do the results that you just went through. Again, let me know about any questions that you have, and I'm gonna wind up by talking a little bit about MAS going forward. Uh, both discouraging to some extent in the short term, but very encouraging for the long term. What we're looking at right now is that we probably are not, almost certainly are not going to have a 22 iteration of Metro Atlanta Speaks that resembles what we did last year or even back to 2014, and perhaps not even a full regional survey. The reason for this predominantly is just financial pressure in funding this survey. It's getting more and more expensive, even with the mixed mode uh, methodologies that we've gone to in the last couple of years. So we're having trouble identifying the funding sources to do things the same old way. But then again, there's a lot of reason why, even if we had the funding uh, in place to do things the same old way, we want to transition to a way to be more flexible, to be a way more way to be more timely with the questions, a way to dive deeper into the why behind the answers that we're getting to questions. And for that reason, uh, we may do a stopgap of a 1.25 in 2022, but we have started kicking around a concept and exploring a concept about a Metro Atlanta Speaks 2.0 that really uses the branding, uses the name Metro Atlanta Speaks to really build out a community engagement survey panel-based platform that would allow us to do multiple surveys over time and maybe bring back a broader survey like the Metro Atlanta Speaks uh, prior year implementation, but perhaps even bring together surveying that we do for our mobility group, for our transportation group, for our land use group, maybe even provide a platform for our partners to do some online surveying. We want to broaden out the surveying methodology and you know, access that we provide, not only internally, but potentially externally as well. And we're doing a pilot uh, of this panel methodology with our Georgia commute options this summer, and we'll obviously keep you uh, advised of how that's going. And we're also trying to identify specific funding options, foundation, or, you know, even exploring with our uh, previous consultant, Kennesaw State, some options to maybe endow the development of this new platform going forward. So I wanted you to be aware of this, not only to expect maybe not a MAS this year, just like you've received in past years, but also to acquaint you with the broad outlines of this new concept that we're turning over for broadening the platform and really blending it together with a lot of the other community engagement work that we're doing. So let me wind up with that. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Uh, Jim, we do have one question. Um, OK, this is from uh, Joseph Hacker. Um, to what degrees does perception match with the distribution of crime statistics? Well, certainly, as you see, um, you know, we have a lower crime in our suburban and exurban jurisdictions, and we do have a higher share of respondents in those suburban and exurban jurisdictions that rate crime as the highest problem. But again, yeah, it, it's, it's a perception that's often, uh, certainly if you look at the results, it's a uh, People, when they answer the question about is crime the biggest problem, they're not necessarily thinking about their county. They're not necessarily thinking about their neighborhood. One of the issues is we don't know exactly what they are thinking about in terms of 
where they're judging crime to be the biggest problem. One of the reasons why we want to move to an additional platform, a more flexible platform, is to get more Joseph at the why behind that answer. When uh, someone in a suburban county says crime is a huge problem, are they just talking about the urban core and their need to stay away from the urban core, or keep that away from their area? Or are they talking about more localized conditions? So right now, it's just a generalized answer that we can't totally get at the why behind, and we want to move to a mechanism where we might get more information on that. Anything else? I think that's all we have. I'll give it another minute in case there's any additional questions or any questions from the audience. She has she has a lot of attention on her. She's the only life person. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. Um, I think uh, thanks so much. Uh, I think I am up next. Uh, my name is Carrie Stevens. I am a program manager here at the Atlanta Regional Commission, and I am also the project manager for the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, which is known as our SEDS. May not be able to get my slides going. Look at it. Yeah, right. Looks fine on the virtual side. Oh, it does? <laughs> yes, but in terms of switching in the other tab. Thanks, guys. <laughs> There, we, there go. we go. Normally you can just hit the arrow. There you go. There we go. Back to the beginning. All right. Well, I'll start over again. Uh, again, Carrie Stevens, uh, program manager here at the Atlanta Regional Commission. And I will say thank you for my technical help. I, I do not have amazing technical skills. So thanks so much for helping me out. Uh, so what is the SEDS? Um, the SEDS here, this is the definition uh, that comes from the Economic Development Administration. And it's the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, or the SEDS. Uh, really, it's a process, and the process is the outreach and research on trends and the conditions in the Atlantic in the Atlanta um, region. And then it comes up with a document that's an actionable and implementable document that we can use for the next five years and beyond. Uh, the great thing is it allows us to uh, identify our strengths and weaknesses uh, throughout this region. Uh, it also allows us to bring together all of our partners. Uh, this includes anyone that works in economic development. So we have our nonprofits. We have a lot of our city governments that are represented here on this call. Uh, we have government leadership. We have for people that work in transportation. So there's a lot of different people that come together to help us look at what's happening in the Atlanta region. So this document is going to be our roadmap uh, that works for everyone moving forward. So it generates good jobs, uh, hope to diversify the economy, and spur economic growth. So some of you on this call may have been involved in our last SEDS. It was known as Catalyst. Uh, if you were not involved, uh, you can go right here to this link and this presentation will be online uh, and you can check out what the last SEDS looks like and compare it to what we are creating today. Uh, so those of you who are not familiar though, uh, this is required by the EDA for us to complete a SEDS and that is because we are designated the economic development district for this region. It includes 11 different counties. Uh, Forsyth County was added last summer, so uh, originally it was 10, now it's 11. We update this document every five years. Uh, it is submitted to ADA, their office, for regional review and hopefully approval. Uh, we always do a great job getting all of the requirements done uh, and go above and beyond to make the SEDS uh, a document that works for our region. Uh, so one important part of uh, having this document is approved is funding mechanisms. Uh, so there's uh, funding mechanisms such as the Public Works and Economic Adjustment Assistance Programs, uh, CARES Act. Uh, as Jim said, uh, Metro Atlanta Speaks was partially funded last year by the CARES Act. We are using CARES Act funds to update this plan. We do have a consulting firm that is helping us. Uh, we are also doing projects with Career Rise, 
We are doing projects with the Airtropolis Atlanta Alliance. Uh, they are updating their regional, their area plan. Uh, so we're helping with those dollars. So there's a lot of dollars tied uh, to this particular uh, plan and it getting approved. In addition to that, um, for your local plans, this will be adopted by our board. Uh, so it will be something you can use when you're applying for grants if they fall under the different programs and projects that are under this plan. So our schedule, uh, we are deep in it at the moment. We our consulting team is doing a lot of research on the trends and conditions in the city and excuse me in the metro Atlanta region. Uh, we are also doing a lot of outreach activities, which I will describe at the end of the presentation and how you can get involved. We do have to have a good draft of this plan done by the end of June and submitted to the Economic Development Administration. But we do have until the end of the year to formally adopt it by our board. So there will be time for additional comments uh, through the rest of the summer and the and the fall before we have to formally adopt it. I'm going to briefly go over some of the data and the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats uh, that we have been working on with our consulting team. This is not a deep dive into all of the research. Uh, in data analysis that has been done, uh, but it is an opportunity for us to look at things on a high level um, and kind of inform us when we're answering some of the questions we'll be asking in just a little bit. So our guiding principles. Of course, this document is to strengthen our regional economy, but we definitely want to increase equitable capacity and to promote economic resiliency. So in a cluster analysis, we have five different clusters, information management, transportation and warehousing, admin and waste management, which is a, an interesting term, which doesn't have a lot to do with waste management, has a lot to do with other sectors uh, as far as management and social services and the administration section, and then wholesale trade. Uh, it is interesting that over the pandemic, these have remained the same. Uh, and uh, industries, industry clusters such as information uh, have actually grown. These are our 20 largest employers. Uh, you can see it's it's a, um, a mix between education, private business, and medical health care. I was interested to see uh, that Emory University actually has more employees than Delta. Um, but these are some of the larger employers uh, that we do want to partner with when we're looking at ways to make the region stronger. And by firm size, uh, it's interesting that 60% of people in the Atlanta region are employed by firms that are 500 plus employees. That's considered a large firm, but only 3% of the firms in Atlanta are those large firms, those 500 plus employees, but they make up 66% of the payroll. Uh, so that's a really interesting, those are really interesting statistics uh, for us to work with when we're thinking about um, workforce in our region. But conversely, uh, small businesses, which are under 500, actually create more jobs and have over the last 10 years. So you can see here it's about 270,000 jobs were created by those small businesses compared to 167,000 jobs by the large businesses. So we do definitely want to look at both sides of the economy because they're both doing things for the Atlanta region. Um, there is uh, on, on the flip side as far as um, annual closure rate, those large businesses do seem to sustain over time and over those 10 years, whereas the small businesses uh, tend to close at a larger rate. So that is something that we want to look at when we're looking at the economic plans. Small business ownership, as you can see here on this chart, uh, white owned businesses are a significant more per, uh, 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 represent a significant more percentage of businesses in the region and a much more significant amount of the revenue generated in our in our region. Uh, similarly, we have female versus male owned businesses. That's about you know 52 to 48, which is kind of half and half. Uh, but then male owned businesses have 70 percent of the revenue versus 30 percent of the revenue for female based business ownership. Uh, going into the poverty rate, as you can see here, African American and Hispanics um, are a little over the metro uh, average, Hispanics being larger. Uh, people with no high school or a high school degree often tend to be over the poverty rate, and unfortunately, a lot of our youth uh, are over the poverty rate. 
and the concentration of poverty, you can see the numbers here, um, a, a large portion of African Americans, again, and youth. So these are some of just the trends and the existing conditions in the Atlanta region that we do want to think about when we are working towards making our region stronger and making it more equitable and bridging some of those gaps that have been identified by some of this information I've presented. So input session, we're hoping you have some input on some questions <laughs> that we uh, uh, that we're posing as part of this plan. So what are ac what actions are needed to strengthen this economy, uh, to increase our equitable inclusion, to promote economic resiliency and what type of partnerships are needed? Um, we, we definitely want to see where some of those large Fortune 500 companies that are very stable can help some of our small businesses. Hopefully that's a great partnership. Uh, so we wanted to see if you had any input on that and I'll ask Jared to come up and see if we can get to the chat. We have any questions in addition to that, if you don't have any uh, comments on these specific questions, uh, I'd also like to throw it out there. If you have any uh, strengths or challenges uh, in your communities that you'd like to let us know about, we'd, we'd love to hear that as well. Thanks, Jared. Yep. And um, no, nope. right now we don't have any questions, but feel free to answer them in the chat. Yep, we'll give a few minutes as Jared said, takes a minute to. And that can be in your community uh, where you work. It can also be in organizations that you work with uh, that you have strengths, weaknesses or general needs uh, that you would like to be addressed as part of this plan. We have any additional I just have a few more slides on how you can participate uh, so this will be posted online uh, and my contact information is at the end of the presentation so I'm happy to take uh, answers to any of these questions and any comments you might have uh, after the fact oh there we go so outreach activities, we're doing a lot of different outreach uh, activities as part of this plan. We want to hear from you. Uh, so we have uh, taken uh, a lot of thought into thinking of different organizations and groups across the region. Uh, so we have targeted surveys for uh, economic development professionals, city and regional planners, government leaders, small businesses, nonprofits, faith based communities, creative and arts communities and education. So I have links. I have links here to general uh, surveys that might be of interest to this group. Uh, so I have the general, which is just general regional questions, uh, economic development and planning, city and regional planners and government leaders. So uh, please go ahead and take these surveys. They help us out a lot uh, as we're working on the plan. Uh, as part of this also, uh, when we sent out the follow up to this meeting, we'll send all of the links to those surveys. So if you have people in your community that represent those other groups, they can certainly take the surveys. Uh, we will be sending out information on focus groups. Uh, they are going to similar groups, so we'll have in person and virtual focus groups. Uh, so we'll have again economic development professionals and planners, government leaders. We definitely want to get involved with small businesses and workforce. Uh, we'll also be working with um, the chambers uh, to work with larger businesses, education, nonprofits, uh, creatives, and then identified demographics. We do have a website that is up. That's showing up there, uh, but this is the link to the website. We also have a contest going on the SEDS, which is again the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, not the most exciting name. Uh, so if you think of a name that might more aptly represent this plan, uh, you can go to our website and give us a suggestion. So thank you so much again. Carrie Stevens, Program Manager here at the Atlanta Regional Commission. That's my phone number and my contact information. And then if there's any additional questions, I'm happy to take them now or at any time uh, in the future. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much, Carrie. And thank you, uh, thank you everyone for attending our um, first in-person LUCC in a two years. Uh, you know, we will we will not have an LUCC in May, but we will do one in June. Um, we are actually thinking about doing it as a LUCC field trip and bringing back those. Um, if you have any, we would like to focus on an LCI community, 
So if you have any interest um, in hosting us, please reach out to myself or Molly. Um, but in the next week or so, because we are trying to finalize that um, and get that ready to go. But we will have a great discussion about some of the upcoming changes to um, the LCI program for 2023. It's hard to believe we're already talking about that. Um, so with that, um, thank you for everyone. Um, we'll be also sending out the survey links again um, and the results of the Metro Atlanta Speaks. So thank you and have a great Wednesday.